Good morning and welcome to the Amarillo Evangelical Baptist Mission. It's good to have you all here with us this morning. It is October. Wow. Isn't that crazy how fast it came? Yeah. Uh, it's already October and so the temperature outside is still, I wouldn't say cold, but I definitely say it's dropping. So um, I like that and I don't like that. You know, I like it to a point but then it starts to get too cold and I don't like it as much. <laughs> but I like being able to open my windows and cool the house down, right? Amen. Uh, before we get started this morning, Brother Gary, would you open us up in prayers real quick? Yeah. Father, thank you for this wonderful morning you gave us again. Father, I ask that your spirit would just lead us and guide us throughout this day. Father, we would can be used for your glory, Father, and your honor. Father, bless this service. Bless your words. Father, just lift us up in the spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So um, I like to start off with positive social media. So that's where I'm going to start again today. Um, like I said, I hope somebody gets something out of that because I know that I certainly do. And so I, I feel like if I do, somebody else does. Um, when you guys think of the happiest book in the Bible, what, what book do you think? Of? And I'm going to be honest, I, I didn't think about this at first, but there was a little bit more context kind of brought to light and then it just made more sense, right? Well, the book that they refer to is the happiest book in the Bible is actually Philippians. And it says here, Philippians is known as the happiest book in the Bible, yet it was written in prison. Moral of the story, don't let your circumstances steal your joy. Amen. How awesome is that? You know, in this particular situation, you're so you're so excited and so wrapped up in the fact that God is still in control that even in prison, you're sharing the word. You're like, hallelujah, you're praying you're praying and preaching and worshiping anywhere. You're sharing the word with anybody and it hasn't changed you at all, except for it may have given you more joy. We realize that that suffering for him is, I mean, it equals eternal reward, right? So it, it's totally worth it. And they say that a lot of times that if we're not experiencing any type of persecution whatsoever, we might also have to ask ourselves why, right? Why are we not? Secondly, I like this. Um, Y'all ever go to the doctor and you fill out your paperwork and it has all your you know, your name, your address, your insurance, who's responsible to pay the bill, but then it always asks you about your emergency contact. This one says prayer must be your lifestyle, not just your emergency contact. Don't just pray when you're in trouble, you know? Pray all the time. We're to, we're to pray good, bad, and everything in between, you know? A lot of times, uh, I know that I've, I've been guilty in my life many times of not praying before I do something, not praying to get God's intervention and his and his thoughts on the, the matter before I move forward. You know what I mean? So, but we're supposed to be praying all the time and, and definitely prayer of thanks. Anybody ever ask God for anything? Okay. Has God ever answered your prayer? Yeah, and no. Uh... Yes and no. Sometimes no is an answer. Sometimes no is the answer. Check this out. Do we ever say thank you? Uh -huh. We need to make sure we do. Because just like anybody else, he wants to be told thanks. Right? So we've got to keep that in mind. Thirdly this morning, what do you all consider to be the sweetest time of the day? I couldn't help but share this one. This one says, the sweetest time of the day is when you pray. Because you are talking to the one who loves you the most. There's nobody on earth that loves you more than he does. Not one. Your best friend, your spouse, uh, your kids, your, your uncle. There's nobody who loves you like God does. Not one. And then check this out. This, this one I've seen before, and I may have shared before, but I think we all need to be aware of this. I feel like anytime you share the gospel with somebody, if you don't share about salvation, you miss the mark, right? So I wanted to share this morning, salvation. It's a receipt. It says right there under the word salvation, Jesus paid it all. It says sin, shame, regret, past mistakes, unforgiveness, hurt, anger, pay. Debt, pay. I like that. Change zero, grand total zero. You don't know anything. Jesus took it all on himself at the cross. Everything. All right, so let's dive in. I'm 
I'm hoping that we're going to be able to answer some questions, but check this out today. Today, the questions are going to be more personal. In other words, you're not going to be able to answer the question necessarily as a group and say that this is true or untrue for everybody. It's going to be more personal tonight. So today, I'm not, I'm not really going to ask what you think. I'm still going to throw the questions out there because that's what God hits me with. And so I'm going to put it out there like that. First question, and this one may be a little bit more of a group. What does the throne in heaven look like? What does the throne in heaven look like? Secondly, what and whom was written down and documented as being in heaven with God? Okay. And lastly, this is more or less that personal one. Does this information cause you to believe in him more or less? You see, to a lot of people, we when we read the Bible, there are parts of it, even as us believers, that are almost harder for us to believe. Why? Well, because we've never seen it. We've never experienced it with our own eyes. We've never been in the room while these things have happened. And so we start to look at it as kind of fictional, right? But then we got to remember in a background, this is where faith resides. This is where faith sets in. And you got to remember that he is God. He's not me, right? So there's things that he can do that I absolutely couldn't get close to trying to do, right? And so we got to, if you've ever been guilty of this before, I've done this before, I try to measure God's abilities next to my own, right? And then I got to remind myself, hey, hold on a second. God is so much more superior in all of his being than I'll ever be, than I've ever been, even at my best. So God's resources are not man's resources. So we need to be aware of that. So we're going to dive in from where we left off last week. Uh, as we study the, uh, study the Bible together this morning, I want you to try to imagine uh, that you are seeing the throne of heaven through the words that are going to be shared this morning. And before we dive right, right in, we're actually going to start in Revelation 4. But before we do that, I want to go back to Revelation 3 and finish up from verse 19 because verse 4 is going to take off uh, exactly from three, okay, and it actually started to give me a little bit more depth when I read it to, when I read it this last time. So starting in verse nineteen, those whom I love, I rebuke. This is Jesus talking, and discipline. So to be earnest, so I'm sorry. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so we talked a little bit about that context. But I didn't realize how by verse 4 picked it up. I not only picked it up, but picked it up right there from the knocking on the door to what was seen as the door was opened. Did y'all know that that happened? I did so we're going to cover that, okay? So starting off in chapter 4, verse 1 starts off with, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Do you think that has any significance to the door that was being knocked on? Absolutely. And the voice I had, I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now imagine for a second that Jesus is standing before you or up in heaven and he's saying, Gary, come up here. Woo! I want to go. Right? Wow. I'm, I'm still scared though. Right? Who's, who's not scared? You're scared of what you don't know. But God says, well then, come up here. Let me show you what's going to happen next. Right? It's pretty, pretty, pretty wild. Verse 2 says, at once... I was in the spirit. Stop for a second. At once, I was in the spirit. The Holy Spirit indwelt inside of me. At once, right then, I was in the spirit. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. You think God's sitting on the throne this morning? Oh, yes, he is. Amen. So who do you suppose he's seeing? Exactly. Seeing God. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruth. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, 
and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. Verse 5 says, From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbling and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God, also referred to as the seven churches of God, right? Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Okay. Um, now I'm going to tell you, some of these things are going to be incredibly hard to envision. Just to think about what you would see if this was you giving that report. And how can you explain heaven and all of its brilliance to anybody else in a way that even comes close? Right? In a way that even scratches the surface. Right? Wow. In the center around the throne were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and in back. Now when you think about this, you read this, this sounds like science fiction. This is the kind of thing you would expect to see, hear, read about in sci-fi. But this is not sci-fi, and this is not fiction. This is very, very real, and this is, this is very, very real from a spiritual realm, which is even harder to understand for us than the earthly realm, right? So we have to wrap our minds around this and become faithful to the fact that these four creatures do exist, right? And that they had eyes all around them. So they're able to see everything coming and going from wherever their angle is. Verse 7 says, The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Okay, so what does it mean to be like something? Generally very similar in appearance, right? But usually to be like something, you're not exactly that thing. But that was the best way to describe what he was saying, right? So you have these four, these four creatures that have eyes all around them. Verse 8 says, Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Can y'all can y'all can y'all even fathom this? Wow. <clears throat> These creatures with six wings. Now obviously, how many of y'all have seen a flying lion? A, a flying lion. I've never seen a flying lion either. Which is why I say before, talking about the first creature was like a lion, it's not saying that it was a lion. It's saying it was like a lion. Probably similar to a lion in appearance, but had six wings and flying around and has eyes all around it, even under the wings. But day and night, these creatures are flying around and circling the throne, and they say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Does that sound like a song we sing in church sometimes? Yes, amen. Amen. Somebody pulled it from Scripture, which is exactly what we're supposed to do. Verse 9 says, Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him, who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and they say, and I'm going to stop real quick before I go into that. Think about this. If these four creatures are consistently encircling the cross, or I'm sorry, the throne rather, and, and they continue to say, holy, 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 Right? Is the Lord God Almighty. And every time they do that, the elders fall down before him and they're worshiping. They're on their knees worshiping. They lay their crowns before him before they're about to say what they're about to say. What does this tell you about those 24 elders? They were on their knees a lot. Right? Over and over and over again. They probably had enough time to stand up, sit down before the creatures are holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And back down to the 24 elders that now put in their crowns before him. And this is what they're going to say. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. 
if he created all things, what does that say about us? We were individually created. God didn't just say, okay, I'm going to take this cluster. It's not We're not like an ice cube tray. We just pour water in it, freeze it, and everything's exactly the same. We are all different. Somehow, some way, we have differences. That means that God created us unique. We're all unique of each other. We're all different. And it says right here, by your will they were created and have their being. What does it mean to have your being? It means that you've got a purpose. You've got a different calling, a different plan in your life than, than I do in mine. Right? Everybody's got a different path. And yet God will... He, he will intertwine those paths, have us cross paths with each other, have us work together, encourage one another, support one another, uh, lift us up when we're broken, and yet right after that, call us right back to different paths. We're all on different paths, but we're all headed the same direction. Amen? Only God can do that. And starting off in chapter 5, it says, Then I saw the right hand of him, who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Okay? So picture this. Holding a scroll and you can see that it's very clearly sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Picture that. Picture being in heaven and hearing that. But no one in heaven or on earth or out of the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root, if you'll notice it's capitalized, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> that's, that's somebody we, we know by the name of Jesus. Right? Able to do all of that. Right? And verse 6 kind of takes it a, a little further in what you're envisioning. Verse 6 says, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Wow. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Oh, man. Who was sent out into the earth? Holy Spirit. Really? No, Jesus, Jesus was given to the world to redeem the world. You know, in the beginning, God, God gave man the world. Man was very, if I how, how dare I say, I mean, very irresponsible with, with that gift. And God sent man into the world to redeem the world. So who's the world belong to now? It's him. him. It's his. It's not ours anymore. He gave it to us once, and he said, "Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and get that back." <laughs> yeah. That's not that right. Right. So he has it. It's his. But God sent Jesus, the perfect, perfect sacrifice for our sins. Wow. I, 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 I can't, for the life of me, Gary, I can't, I can't get past the fact that Jesus never once talked bad. He never said a word. Never muttered under his breath, mom, mom, dad, in the earthly sense that were given to him. And asked him to do something, and he did. Never talked bad. Never cussed. Makes me wonder if he ever did, if he ever busted his, his finger with a hammer, because we know he was a carpenter. If he ever busted his finger, what did he say? Oh, wow. Did he just, ah, you know, but have no real word to it, no real anger to it? What was he really like? Wow. And that's that's where I get lost. I get caught up in it. I'm like, man, he's, we're not even worthy to be in the same room. You know, isn't that wild? How was he really like? You know, we hear the word perfect, but can we fathom that? God sent the perfect, perfect one to the world. 
verse 7 says, He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. In other words, Jesus came up and took the throne from his father. Or not the throne, but the scroll. Verse 8 says, And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. <laughs> Amen. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. Before we go into that, let's picture that. Can you picture that even for a second? Holding these these golden bowls. When we hear the word incense, that's easy for us to think of. But it's hard for us to understand the spiritual understanding of the prayers. Holding bowls of prayers. Which means that when we pray, it doesn't just, you know, hit the window and hit the floor, right? It, it goes to him. He saved him. Yeah, if we're, if we're really talking to him and we're really asking for anything or we're giving thanks for anything, he holds them, he has them. You know, uh, he doesn't treat them like emails. Uh, I responded to that one, do we? I'm not even going to respond to that one, do we? Right? Wow. He loves them all. I like how you said that, Jerry. I love them. He keeps them all right there. And I mean, that's that's almost unfathomable to me. I, I don't know what I what I would do if I was able to see such a thing. This is what they're saying as they hold those bulls now. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Amen. Yeah. You don't have to be a particular group or a particular member of any race, any type of skin color, just by the fact that you're you're created, you have an opportunity to experience eternal life, eternal salvation, wow. forgiveness. And God gave that to us. He gave it to us through his son. You know, uh, there's only one way to the Father, and it's through the Son. There is no other way. Good works will not get you there. Being a nice human being will not get you there. <coughs> Cleaning your room because your parents told you to will not get you there. Right? Feeding the dog ain't going to do it. Shoveling snow here in the next couple of months, couple of five months maybe. Be shoveling snow. If it's Amarillo, you might be shoveling snow all the way to April. It's hard to say. Right? May. <laughs> All right, but that's the only way to get to the Father is through the Son. So if you want to get into heaven, you have to accept Jesus. It's the only way. Verse 10. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. God's not, God's not saying you're gonna you're gonna struggle to share the word. Now you may suffer for the word. You're gonna you're gonna have opportunities to share the word. You're gonna have opportunities to share him. And like I say, some people say, "Well, well, that doesn't cost you anything." Uh, I wouldn't go that far. Look, inviting Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior is free. There is no cost to that. But following Jesus Christ with your life could cost you. A lot. But if you lose your life, it says in the Word, if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it try to save your life, you will lose it. Pretty wild thought, isn't it? it? Makes us all look at the way we're living our life. What are we doing with the time we have? Are we just biding time? Are we hoping we're going to live forever? Or are we living every day for Him? And if we're living every day for Him, guess what? It don't matter. It don't matter what day we're going to die. We know where we're going. No fear to be had, right? So we've got to get back on fire for Him. Verse 11 says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, check this out, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. Can you imagine seeing all these angels? It's as if you weren't already going to be on your knees before the Father and the Son. Woo! I scarce can take it in. Sound like another song? Scarce can take it in, meaning that I would look at it. I, I don't know that I'd be able, that my heart would be, I'd be 
thumping with so much excitement and joy. I don't know if we can take it. You know, it's like that's like your heart beating because you're so happy. Not scared, not running from the law. <laughs> you know, but just happiness engulfing you. Oof. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is a lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Because you know what? All of those things are his. They're all his. If you've ever been thankful for anything and you thank somebody for giving you a gift, you really need to be thankful for him because he supplied the gift. All things that were created were created by him. Crazy to think about, right? It's one of the reasons that it's so important that we remember to be thankful for the little things. We assume our little things. Uh, anybody eat breakfast this morning? Anybody get anything to eat today? Okay. And so whenever we get something to eat, even if it seems minute, I have a, a box of cereal on my desk, and most of the time it's Lucky Charms, which I know are not healthy, but I like to eat them from the cup, and I eat them without milk. Oh, I do too. And, and now I have... Now I have a box of Cheerios. So right, I guess I'm fooling people there, all right? Because I got something healthy to replace it with. But I eat those dry as well. And even in my Cheerios, and I've got the box there on the desk, every morning before I eat them, I at least try to remember to give him thanks for giving them to me. Right? And some people are like, well, you already prayed once and you got the box still there. Yeah, but I was praying over what I was about to eat. And tomorrow, if I pour another cup, that's another blessing. We give you thanks for it. How many people remember that song, Worthy as a Lamb Who Is Slain? That's more of a newer song. I can't I can't think of an older hymn, but that doesn't mean there's not one. There's there's many hymns I don't know. But I think of a newer song where that's that's actually the chorus, right? Worthy as a lamb who is slain. Verse 13 says, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and all the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory uh, and power forever and ever it's his and falling down on our knees before him in the earthly sense is the acknowledgement and the obedience to follow him to know who he is we just simply know who he is. And we fall down before him as a sign of respect. That's, I'm thinking about, about uh, John. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not him. I'm not the Messiah. But check out what he does next. But he is. That's Jesus. And that's what our message needs to point out every time we share the word. I'm not him. In fact, me personally, there's nothing special about me. But I want to introduce you to somebody that's going to change your life for real. Right? And we point out. And John was so adamant. He said, look! There he is! Why are you still looking at me? Do you not hear what I said? Look, it's Jesus! Look! If I gotta hide under the table to get the attention where it needs to be, that's what I'll do. Right? He said, look, basically my ministry's finished. My job was to lay the way for him. And he's here. Now if I can even work beside him in any way, that's exactly what I want to do. To finish up chapter 5, verse 14 is the last one. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worship. I don't know if I broadened your horizons at all this morning on what heaven actually looks like. But it's maybe a short sermon this morning, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's definitely powerful. Lots of power in the Word of God. And check this out. I just kind of did this to give you a sense, right? No matter what your idea of what heaven looks like, no matter what ideas you're able to come up with in your mind, 
no matter what you see in your dreams, when you consider the holy, holy, holy place of heaven, no matter what you can fathom, no matter what you can think, no matter what God showed him personally, it still does not equate to what heaven actually is. That's right. It does not even get close to the magnificence and the brilliance surrounding both, both the Father and His Son. That's and eternal. Isn't that amazing? There is no, there's no level of brilliance that you can even think that even scratches the surface. That's how amazing God is. That's how beautiful heaven is. And God is opening the door. Look at how, look at how chapter 3 ended. Jesus is saying, I'm knocking on your door. All you have to do is answer me. All you have to do is answer me. And if you do, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. He's creating an opportunity for fellowship. You know, friends in this day and age are not that much different. We consider ourselves to be real friends with somebody when we invite them over for dinner and break bread with them. That's one of the first things we'll say in an argument. I broke bread with you! <laughs> because that was personal to us. That meant something to us. Young men, when we when we meet girls that we are, that we are really uh, starting to like and starting to care for, we generally try to bring them home to meet our parents. Or she might try to bring him, bring him home to meet mom and dad. Now, why do you do that? Because you want it to be personal. I want you, I care so much about this person that I want you to know who they are. Mom, dad, this is such and such. Right? What if I was to tell you that Jesus does the same thing for you with his father? starting part of chapter 4. Come up here! Come here! Let me show you what's going to happen next. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine forgiveness like that? Where we live our lives in complete disobedience to Him. And we take our final breath. And at the gates of heaven, Jesus says, We have it so crazy. We, we have it so twisted because we, we sometimes get to a place where we feel like we deserve it. And we don't. Nobody deserves it. I don't care how good you are, how bad you are. Nobody deserves it. But by the grace of God, which I might add is more than sufficient for all of us, He allows us that opportunity to come in our own language. Because when we enter that gate, God sees His Son. And He sees past all of our transgressions. He passes over what we deserve because of the Son. That's the kind of love that God has for us. It's so amazing. And I can't understand it. I can sit here and talk about it all day long. But I really, in its fullness, cannot understand it. Amen. Brother Weldon, would you close us in prayer this morning? Father, we just come to you this morning. We're grateful for what you've given us. There's a lot of times we're not thanking you for it, Lord. We just thank you for this message. Amen. To open our hearts up, Lord. With each and every one of us, there's no separate ways today. Lead us and guide us. And forgive us where we fail thee. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Tune in next week. We'd love to have you with us. Amen.